Your Honor, we have two other matters. One is a motion that I believe I copied, Your Honor, and opposing all counsel with yesterday. That's a motion to sever. Uh, you know, it's evidence developed during the testimony of Travis McMichael. And as we went through the charge conference on Friday, it does seem at this point, for the reasons that are stated in the motion, uh, that Mr. Ryan's defenses are sufficiently antagonistic, and there's certainly sufficient spillover if, from nothing else, the vigilante evidence uh, that was presented against Travis McMichael on Thursday. Uh, and under the totality of circumstances, we believe that Mr. Bryan is entitled to a severance. But beyond that, I will stand on the written motion that's filed. Anything from the state? Your Honor, we ask that the court deny um, the motion for sever. Uh, to, to make a motion to sever, the defendant would have to show uh, clear prejudice. And looking at all the bullet points alleged by Mr. Goff, and Judge, if the court would like me to go through them one at a time, I can, but none of them um, show any reason for severance because there is no showing of clear prejudice here uh, that would um, be a denial of due process. So we would just ask the court to deny the motion for severance, Judge. But if you would like me to, I can definitely go through each one and cite some case law for the court. I think we need to make a clear record on it. The other issue I have is this is after the close of all evidence. So I don't believe it's, it's even timely. Um, there is very little, if anything, about this case that had not been already addressed by the court from an evidentiary standpoint <clears throat> well prior to even the <coughs> swearing of the panel. And this has not been raised uh, in a formal motion, although it was threatened, discussed, not, well, not discussed. It was threatened a number of times during the trial. It was never actually submitted as a motion. So I believe to begin with, it's untimely, but I, I would like to hear from the state on the, uh, the basis and that Your the Honor, state believes that it should be denied. And Your Honor, unless I'm mistaken, I believe it was raised in his omnibus packet, but um, from the July motions, was it raised in your omnibus packet? I believe it was. Well, I think we reserved it. In the omnibus, uh, I, my recollection is it's, it was reserved, okay. uh, consistent with what's taking place during the trial. Um, I know we had prepared a, a written motion for severance, and we elected not to file it uh, earlier in the case. But I think the charge conference on Friday covered a great many legal issues which had been unresolved prior to Friday legal issues that are at the heart of this case. Your Honor will recall the discussion of several points that it was suggested were akin to directing verdicts of guilt. Uh, the other issue is the vigilante social media or, or messaging uh, that came in on Thursday afternoon during the cross-examination of Travis McMichael. Now, I'm not saying that somewhere in 20 million gigabytes worth of discovery, that wasn't, that, wasn't low, that wasn't there. I'm sure it was. But the state had not indicated, I don't believe, to any of the counsel in advance of the trial that they intended to use that. They did not use all kinds of other evidence uh, that was highly prejudicial. But in any event, until they actually present that testimony, they don't create that issue. And then there's also the after-the-fact conspiracy issue and spillover from the unindicted fourth defendant, Jackie Johnson, uh, and the complications that has created. Anyway, Your Honor, uh, I filed a motion. The court can deny it. It's untimely. The court can hear from the state. Uh, we can go from there. Yeah. I'll, I'll hear from the state. I just want to make sure we've got a clear record on it. Go ahead. So, Your Honor, in ruling on a severance motion, the court should consider the likelihood of confusion of the evidence in law the possibility that evidence against one defendant may be considered against the other defendant and the presence or absence of antagonistic defenses. We don't believe we have antagonistic defenses here. A defendant who requests severance bears the burden to make a clear showing that a joint trial would lead to prejudice and a consequent denial of due process. 
Um, notably, a showing that a separate trial merely would give the defendant a better chance of acquittal is insufficient. Um, in terms of the actual bullet points in the motion, Judge, I think numbers one through five essentially deal with um, voir dire, uh, Jackie Johnson, something from the Atlanta Journal Constitution, I believe Mr. Goff meant to put, it says prosecution, and other media outlets that are talking about Ms. Johnson being the fourth defendant. Also, he mentioned that several jurors have expressed concern about the delay in the prosecution in the case. I think he meant to put their potential jurors. Um, as far as bullets one through five go, the potential jurors were questioned, Judge, at length about opinions regarding the delay in the arrests of the McMichaels and Mr. Bryan. Those jurors are potential jurors who said they could not be fair and impartial due to their feelings about the delay, if any, were excused by the court for cause. Those jurors said that uh, they could be fair and impartial or the jurors we have seated here making up the jury for this case. Also, the court has instructed the jury to stay away from the news media on this case. Um, and we've seen no evidence that they've actually not been able to follow that law. There is absolutely, absolutely no evidence that they went and saw the AJC article that Mr. Goff is talking about. Therefore, we don't believe he's made a clear showing of president, uh, I'm sorry, prejudice in bullets one through five. As far as bullets uh, six through seven, the only evidence of Greg McMichael's ties to the Glynn County Police Department is that maybe a few of the officers, I believe, um, Detective Lowry testified that he knew Greg McMichael in passing. Um, Detective Parker Marcy also, I believe, he testified that he knew of him. But they didn't have any close relationships with Greg McMichael that would tend to show any reason for a cover-up. Also, notably, Jackie Johnson's name was never, ever mentioned in the presentation of evidence in this case, Judge. Mr. Goff is the only person who keeps bringing her up her name. Uh, we have not elicited any evidence of a cover-up. We don't intend to argue any cover-up because it would be unsupported by the evidence. So here he's made no showing of uh, clear prejudice to his, to his client. As to bullet eight, the evidence showed that Greg McMichael and William Bryan knew each other, but they didn't know each other very well. Actually, um, Mr. Bryan didn't even know Greg McMichael had a son named Travis McMichael. Uh, Travis McMichael testified that he never met William Bryan and there was no express agreement between the McMichaels and Mr. Bryan. There was evidence presented that Mr. Bryan and Greg McMichael were talking to one another right after the homicide happened and during the time when the officers got on scene. But this evidence, even if he were to get a separate trial, would still be admissible in his separate trial. So for those reasons, we don't believe there's been a clear showing of prejudice here either as to bullet eight. As to bullet nine, uh, this court is going to charge the jury as to criminal trespass, burglary, uh, hijacking a motor vehicle as Mr. Goff asked for. Um, and it'll be up to the jury to determine what if any crime the alleged victim committed in this case, Your Honor. Uh, the McMichaels actually never asked for the criminal trespass um, instruction. I believe the state is the one who asked for that instruction. And if Mr. Bryan were to go to trial separately, we would likewise ask for that instruction in his separate trial as well. So um, given that, we don't believe a severance is necessary here. Regarding the different accounts from Travis McMichael and William Bryan, uh, Travis, Travis McMichael's testimony, we would argue, actually helps Mr. Bryan because he got up there and said um, he saw Mr. Bryan being attacked by the victim, his car being attacked by the victim. And then he also said, hey, there was no conspiracy between us. We did not have an express agreement. So rather than hurt his client, we believe that uh, Travis McMichael's testimony actually helps his client. Uh, for those reasons, Judge, we don't believe uh, clear prejudice has been shown here. As far as bullets 10 through 11 are concerned, I want to point the court to Strozier v. State. It's 277 Georgia 78. It's a 2003 case. There, the defendant asserted that the evidence against the co-defendant was so overwhelming compared to the amount of evidence against him that it had a spillover effect on the jury. Essentially, that's what Mr. Goff is arguing here. 
And the court there held that, quote, the fact that the evidence as to one of the two co-defendants is stronger does not demand a finding that the denial of severance motion is an abuse of discretion, where there is evidence showing that the defendants acted in concert. And here, the state's theory of the case is that all these defendants acted as parties to the crime. So um, we believe that based on the holding in Strozier v. State, that no severance is wanted here either, is warranted here either. As to the final um, bullet points, bullets 12 through 14, I want to direct the court to Swain v. State, 275 Georgia 150. It's a 2002 case where the defendant argued that the fact that the jury was jointly selected with the co-defendant denied him his right to a fair and impartial jury. And in this regard, he argued that the jury was not fair and impartial because a jury chosen by two defendants would be different from a jury chosen by one defendant. And there the court held that the mere fact that a jury chosen by two defendants would differ from a jury chosen by one defendant does not deny a defendant a fair and impartial jury. Uh, if it did, then joint trials would effective, effectively be, be prohibited as a joint trial would deny a defendant a fair and impartial jury under the defendant's rationale since defendants are required to share peremptory strikes in selecting the jury. So judge, just to sum up, no showing of ant antagonistic defenses, no showing that the spillover effect would prejudice Mr. Bryan to the point where it would be a denial of due process. So we ask the court to deny the motion to sever. Final word from the movement. Your Honor, I think the, the grounds are covered in the written motion. Uh, I would note that in response to the McMichael's request to remove the charge I submitted on duty to inquire, We would go ahead and withdraw that charge on our own. That would resolve the issue. Uh, I hope that will satisfy the McMichael defendants. <clears throat> Sounds good. I guess sometimes people don't want help. <laughs> All right, let me look at it. Um, I'll have to look at it right now. Uh, before I get to that. Uh, I also have a fourth motion to prohibit any further conduct that may intimidate or influence jurors or otherwise interfere with Defendant Bryan receiving a fair trial, a motion to excuse or inquire further as to juror number 380. The court has looked at it. I think the matter has been addressed a number of times. The motion itself addresses the issues presented by Defendant Bryan. The court intends to deny that motion. The only thing I would ask, Your Honor, is exhibits uh, 7 to 11 are sensitive enough that I wouldn't want them in the public record. Uh, with respect to the anonymity of our juror, as best we're able to preserve it. I have, I'm going to show these to the state, but I'm going to ask the court place exhibit 7 to 11 under seal uh, to preserve the privacy uh, of juror 380. I think the other defendants probably need to see the matters before they're yes. placed under seal. placing those exhibits back in the manila envelope that is marked exhibit 7 to 11. Um, for the time being, I'm just going to attach them to the back side of the motion. Yes, sir. And we'll go ahead and put a sealing order on there. I understand the state has no objection to sealing these. I guess I should probably take a look before we do that.
those exhibits will be filed under seal. The duty to inquire language, the court's going to remove that from the charge. It is a civil case. My research also went on. There's some additional language in there that probably, if we start getting into it, so what I also have is that in addition to that language, which was specifically requested by Defendant Brian, some additional language could also be that the defendant's not necessarily required to verify the information if it appears to be reliable, but and it goes on from there. So I think with that language in there and it being primarily based on a civil case, I'm going to go ahead and remove it. I don't think it's necessary for this charge. So that is the only change the court is making from the draft charge. That again is the citizen's arrest duty to inquire on page 16. Those that one sentence is being removed. All right. With that, is the state ready to proceed? Yes. 